If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4. The Lord has put a message on my heart for this congregation today. And many times people will watch after on video, but God has a word for us today, but it's transferable. Proverbs chapter 4, one verse of scripture, verse 23. Solomon said, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Today I'm going to be talking about guard your heart. Guard your heart. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing in this place. We thank you for the privilege of being here and that we know that when you're in the house, when you're activating things, anything is possible. People can be delivered. They can be healed. They can be set free. Lord, the word can bring an answer in due season at the right time. We're praying, Lord, that something would be unleashed in the pews and Lord over video that people would get what they need that the anointing would destroy the yoke and the power of God would flow in such a way that in our generation we would see greater things than they've ever seen in the past generations. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for being able to be here today with each other and to rub shoulders, God. Uh, help us to get to the place where we guard our hearts uh, because of what is going to come out of it. Lord, we praise you, and God, we honor you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Uh, can you say in Jesus' name? Oh, yeah, that's it. Put your hands together for the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise to the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing so long. Guard your heart. Everybody say, guard your heart. The book of Proverbs was written by Solomon. And it was written to people from a certain standpoint. It was written as a father would talk to his son. And I want to say, first of all, that this is transferable also to ladies because the principle does not just mean I'm talking only to fathers and sons, but I'm talking to daughters too, but I'm using this metaphor of a father and a son so everyone can understand what I'm getting ready to say. But it was written from that standpoint, and it was written to... Uh, bring out and it was written to help us to understand better and to elevate a few things one was knowledge to give us better understanding about knowledge it was also there to give us better understanding about wisdom everybody say wisdom wisdom is the ability to apply the knowledge that we have to our everyday situation but it was also given to us to un to get understanding or comprehension, or revelation, or interpretation. It is there so that we don't just get this knowledge or apply the knowledge, but after we've applied it, we understand, we comprehend why we are applying what we're applying. So the preacher here today, he wants to say some things to you, but he just doesn't want it to go in your ear or into your intellect or into your psyche. And he doesn't just want to, I don't just want to get it to, and preach to the natural man, but go into the spiritual man that understanding would come on the inside of your soul, that your life will be changed forever Solomon went on to say in Proverbs chapter 4 verse 7 he said wisdom this ability to apply things that you know wisdom is the principal thing it's the most important thing wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom and with all thy getting he goes on to say get understanding it's one thing to apply what you know, but it's another thing to begin to understand what you know. It's so important that everybody in here just doesn't stop with just the surface and just the superficial, but goes into the deeper realm of the spirit because God wants to talk to someone here right now under the sound of my voice, and he wants to take you into a new realm. He wants to take you into greater things, but there's something that needs to be understood. 
And he said it in our verse here. Keep thy heart with all diligence. With everything that's on the inside of you, keep, guard, protect your heart with everything. He's saying uh, above everything else, keep your heart with all diligence, vigilance. With everything on the inside of you, he said, I want you to begin to guard it. I want you to begin to protect it. Now, you may ask, what is he talking about keeping my heart? Because you notice that he's focusing on the heart. And he's saying it's like this organ that we have on the inside of us that pumps the blood through the rest of the body. But he's just using that to an, an, as an analogy to really draw attention to what he's really talking about. Because if you have a man or a woman and that person goes on life support, as long as that heart is beating, everything's going to be all right. You can lose limbs. You can be brain dead. All sorts of things. But if that heart stops pumping blood to every part of the body, then the body will just begin to deteriorate and it will cease to exist and decompose and ultimately no longer be able to be brought back. Everything else can fail, but this heart has to keep on going. But but he's not really talking about our natural heart, but he's talking about something a little bit deeper. And I want to bring that out to you when he's talking about our heart and guarding your heart and protecting your heart and keeping your heart. First thing he's talking about is keep, protect, and guard your mind. Everybody say, my mind. This is really what this scripture text is talking about. He's saying you need to guard, you need to protect, you need to keep your mind. I'm talking about your reasoning power and your ability to reason, your intellect. Our intellect is so important to everyone in here that has the ability to converse and to communicate and to talk and even to reason and to build and to dream. All of these things come out of your mind. It comes out of your intellect intellect. The problem is is when we begin to get too smart for our britches and we don't realize that I've got to guard my mind. I've got to guard my heart. This world wants to take my mind. It wants to take my mind, my thinking, my intellect to the point to where I will not be able to do what God wants me to do. Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 12. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies a, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Notice, which is your reasonable service. And then he goes on to say, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. You need to renovate your mind by the renewing of your mind that you might be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm telling you that the enemy is not after your body. He's not after your physical exterior. He's not after the things that you own. He's not after anything, but he is after your mind. He wants you to take, he wants to take your intellect and your reasoning power that you would not lo no longer think about God, but think about things that he would want you to do. We really believe around here at Lighthouse of the Valley in higher education. And we say, go get higher education. But you need to understand that the systems of this world are set up to try and Tear down your intellect to the point where you don't believe that there is a God or a creator or an intellectual being that created all things. Something that is outside of our realm of understanding and being able to explain. Something that we take by faith to believe, but it, it, it's, it's validated as you go along that God is God and he is real. He'll do so much for you. You've got to come to him by faith and you've got to believe in him by faith. But after a while, he'll start letting you see some things, know some things, get wisdom on some things and have some understanding, comprehension about some things that you will know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ uh, is the way the truth and the life uh, and no man cometh unto the father but by him uh, and this system is not set up and your mind 
comes under attack. And that's where you have to begin to build up things to guard it. Paul was an intellectual. Paul was very smart. Paul was a great intellectual mind of his day. The Bible says uh, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the great minds uh, of his days. He sat at his feet and he learned from him. He was a Pharisee of a Pharisee. That means he had the five books of the law from Genesis. Uh, he went Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He had them all memorized uh, word for word. Uh, he can quote it to you if you call on him to quote it to you. He can do that. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews of the stock of Israel. He had the proper lineage. Uh, he had the proper pedigree. He had it all together. But here's what he said when he came to his intellect and he came to his mind. He said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I count it all as rubbish. I count it all as dung that I might obtain the excellency of Jesus Christ. We've got to get to the place. Yes, let's get higher education. And yes, let's grow smarter and become intellectuals. But let's get to the point that we determine not to know anything else except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He went on to say there's this war going on in my members. He's talking about his mind. There's this war going on in my mind. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. He says, somebody deliver me from this death. Somebody get this monkey off my back. He said, in me, that is in my flesh. Talking about my carnal mind. In my mind dwelleth no good thing. To will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good from here, I find not. I'm talking to some people right now that are under attack. And it's coming to your mind. It's coming through your reasoning you're trying to reason all this out you're trying to figure it out you're trying to find your own way to get to God you're trying to find your own way out of your circumstances and in your dilemma right now but you've got to take this mind and let the mind of Jesus Christ be given to you you have the mind of Jesus let this mind Jesus said what Paul said about Jesus. Be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You've got to allow some things to be in your mind. But you also have to guard. You have to keep your heart, your mind. Talking about the mind, we're also talking about, number two, your affections. Everybody say, my affections. These are my passions. These are my emotions. These are my appetites. He said you have to guard your mind, but you've also got to guard your affections, your passions. You've got to guard those things that motivate you and make you move. There are certain things that get you out of your seat. There are some things that excite you and some things that get you to move. And you've got to guard not only your mind, but you've got to guard your passions because your passions can get out of control. Jesus said it like this. Set your affections on things that are above and not not in the world. You got to begin to start looking up and not looking around. And someone on the inside of you is trying to get your passions out of control and your appetites out of control to the point to where it will do what you don't want it to do, but it will do what your natural man wants it to do. And God is just telling us through the scripture text that we've got to guard our minds and we've got to guard our affections, our passions, our appetites. Other words, the uh, another, uh, and us, uh, unless uh, those passions and those pa uh, affections start getting out of control. David, King David, let's go back to when he's a little boy, was a very passionate boy. He led sheep with passion. Everything he did was with passion. When he saw and came into the camp with his brothers to give them lunch, he saw Goliath bellowing, bellowing out, uh, give me a man that he may fight with me. 
And passion is what caused David uh, to go out there with just a slingshot and a rock uh, and run against Goliath. Uh, and he said, you come to me uh, with a sword and a spear, but I come to you uh, in the name of the Lord. Uh, he was passionate uh, about killing. Uh, he was passionate about fighting. Uh, he was passionate uh, about just playing the harp out there with those sheep. He was passionate when he read and sang the songs uh, that you and I read right now. He was a passionate individual that did what he did. Uh, the Bible even said uh, when he became king, uh, be before he became king, uh, and he was a, a big man, uh, and he was in the army of Saul, he went out and they said, uh, Saul, King Saul has killed his thousands, uh, but David has killed his tens of thousands. Uh, when he was on the battlefield, uh, he was passionate uh, about doing the work of the Lord and fighting on the front line. But it was that same Those same affections that caused him to take another man's wife, to have that man killed, to bring that woman into his house, and to lie to the man of God. Passion is so attractive to God. When God was looking to anoint a king, he saw David, and he said, I see a man after my own heart. He's passionate because it's God that we serve. He's a passionate God. The Bible talks about his crucifixion in this way. It was his passion. It was passion that drew, drew him to the cross. It was passion that caused him to climb up on that cross uh, and die for our sins. Uh, he was so passionate. Uh, and when he looked at David, uh, he, see, he said, I see a man uh, after my own heart. Uh, but if we don't guard our heart, uh, we don't guard our affections, uh, we don't guard our mind, uh, if we don't guard it the way our appetites uh, and our passion uh, that flows on the inside of it, uh, it could be replaced and misappropriated. In areas that God never intended it to be. The last thing that I want to talk to you about in this section is that we need to have our heart protected, not only against our mind, not only against our affections, but against our thoughts. Everybody say our thoughts. Not the same as the reasoning and intellectual thoughts, but I'm talking about your dreams. I'm talking about your imaginations I'm talking about your visions as you sit back and daydream about life and and this and that how you want things to be we've got to guard our thought life our dreaming our times that we're down the imagination station where things are born and they're not even there yet you see things before they get there. You've got to watch what you're thinking on and meditating on. You know that? Because if you don't, the Bible talks about other thoughts and other imaginations starting to creep in. And now you've got to do some damage control. But he says it because it tells you to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Because it's in my my in my thought life when we're talking about your mind your affections your thoughts we're talking about your soul who you really are your soul it's the soul that's so important proverbs chapter 11 verse 30 says it like this he that winneth souls is wise who captures souls, holds souls, minds, wills, and emotions, who captures these souls, even your own soul. If you'll keep, you'll hold on to your soul, it's going to be so valuable to you. Notice what Jesus said about it. He was talking in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He says, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your passions? 
your thought life, your intellect, all that. What will it benefit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Nothing. Your soul is so valuable that the enemy wants to infiltrate your mind. Your soul is so valuable that he wants to just lead your passions astray and get them wrapped up on him. The enemy knows your soul is so valuable that he's trying to interject his dreams into your dreams. That your visions are no longer God's visions. The visions of God came to you like they did on the day of Pentecost when they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Dreams and visions were born in them and you, many of you have dreams and many of you have visions just like Joseph had dreams and he had visions. He saw things that God was going to do. He saw the sun and the moon that represented his mother and his father. He saw his stars, the stars of heaven that represented his 12 brothers, 11 brothers bowing before him. He saw all this in a dream. He saw all this in a vision and all these things were true but yet he had not seen everything that had to happen before those things came to pass. He didn't see his brothers hating him. He didn't see his brothers throwing him in the pit. He didn't see his brothers taking him out of the pit and selling him into slavery. He didn't see himself going as a slave into a man's house. He didn't see a woman lying on him about his integrity and taking him out of that house and putting him in prison. But one day he came out of that prison. And don't you believe that through the process of time, while he was all these other places that were not necessarily to him the will of God, the enemy coming into his thinking, his reasoning power, coming into his affections, coming into his thinking and his dreams and trying to replace God's dreams with other dreams, with other imaginations. That's what the enemy tries to do with you. And I'm telling somebody right now that even as I'm speaking, the enemy is trying to replace all that God spoke over you with other things so that you cannot fulfill what God has intended for you. But I break that spirit in the name of Jesus right now by the power I don't care how bad it may seem I don't care how low it may seem I don't care who has said what against you I don't care if you don't feel it it's not even in your passions you can't feel it in your affections I don't care if you're reasoning and you can't figure it out in the name of Jesus and by the authority of the word it shall come to pass as God has intended and spoken it in your life now how do we protect how do we keep how do we guard our mind our affections our thoughts I'll tell you how number one you've got to install everybody say install uh, an alarm system okay <laughs> you're talking about security I know security you got to install alarm systems all around in entry points. You've got to put in some alarm systems in places that you know are entry points into your life, into your mind. You've got to start installing them all around so the alarm bells will go off when the enemy is trying to come in and gain access into your mind, into your thoughts, into your affections. You've got to put alarm systems all around there so every time he tries to get in there, it's going to go off. He is a thief and he is a robber and a thief and a robber. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take stuff from you. And it says a thief and a robber, he doesn't come through the front door. He doesn't come to the door, but he climbs up some other way. You know what? It may not be coming while you're sitting here in this service, but when you leave this service, there are so many things. All of you live in different types of homes, and so it's got to be evaluated. Your home, your body, your mind has to be evaluated different from everybody else's body. 
and mind and thinking and reasoning power. You might be very intellectual or you may not have as much schooling as you need, but yet you have a mind and you are in, have an intellect and you've got to understand the enemy knows where your weak spots are and he's trying to gain access, but you've got to put up an alarm system. The next thing you need to put up, you need to install a video surveillance system. You need to put eyes in the sky. You've got to get to this place where you're connected to Big Brother. Big Brother is the church. They're your eyes in the sky. Big brother is the church. They're your surveillance system and they're watching over you. You're going through life and your mind, you've already put up your alarm system, but you're taking it to another level. And now you're going to put up video surveillance all around that everywhere you go, you're under surveillance. I know some of you don't want to be surveilled in this area of your life and some of you don't want to be surveilled in this area of your life. But if you'll give the church access into every part of your life, we'll help guard Guard your heart. Guard, protect your mind. Guard and protect your thinking, your affections, and your thoughts. Scripture tells you, obey them that have the rule over you. Why? For they watch. They're like a surveillance for your what? Soul. Your mind. I could care less about necessarily about your job, about things, about your finances, but really our pastoral staff and our leadership team and everybody, we're concerned. It ultimately, it all goes together. I know that, but we're really concerned about your eternal destiny where, of your soul. Oh, you don't need to call me. You don't need to get in my life. You don't need to. No, no, no. Unless you install the system, we don't have access. When you start installing the system, you'll be walking and you're, something's getting ready to get in your mind and you're like, you feel like you're on the Truman Show. <laughs> you start realizing where you're at. Those of you who don't know what the Truman Show is. He was on constant surveillance. And Big Brother would do that for you. Next thing you need to do, install your alarm system, your video system. Now you need to enlist the help of guard dogs. <laughs> Beware of the dog. Guard dogs. They say dog is a man's best friend. I would say there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You need to enlist, it, enlist some friends around you, like guard dogs, companions, that will walk this journey with you. They will walk this Christian walk with you to help you watch over your mind, help keep you in check, start calling you on the carpet, start saying this, no, no, start looking at you because they're, they're they have access into your thinking, they have access into your passions, they have access into your affections, they have access into your thought life, and they're saying, I'm here with you. I know you. I'm your buddy. Some brothers need to get with some brothers in here. And that's why the meeting after service uh, and some sisters need to get with some sisters in here and develop some trust uh, because uh, it will help you to guard your heart with all diligence. Solomon went on to say, two are better than one. Two of you together can put 10,000 to flight and set just 1,000 all by yourself. Two are better than one. That means if you need to get to work, you can have a better reward if you have two of you. It says that you'll be able to be warmed if two of you get together and you're cold. It says if one of you falls down, if there's two of you, the other one can raise you back up and lift you up after you've fallen down. It says if two of you are together and one of you gets into a fight, the other one's going to go back to back with you and start, whoop. you mess with him, you mess with me. Two are better than one, and even three are better than that, for a three-fold cord is not easily broken. Somebody needs to get excited. 
about what the Lord wants. You need a companion. You need a guard dog. You need a sheep dog. You need somebody watching your back. They're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You need some guard dogs among you. And the last thing you need to add to that repertoire is you need to become trained in unarmed and armed techniques. Empty hand and fully loaded. You need to be able to handle things with these And if that doesn't work, I've got something else for you. You've got to be able to take care of the situation because he's talking about guarding your mind. You've got this alarm system. You've got this surveillance system. You've got your buddies intact. But then all of a sudden, they may have broken all through that. And now it's going to go mano to mano, man to man. And now you're going to have to deal with it. But you've got to guard your heart with all diligence. Years ago, I used to train law enforcement on on what we call the escalation of force. It was unarmed self-defense, but it was to teach them how to know when to go up to the next level. And I would say the first thing that you do is officer presence. It changes from state to state or from agency to agency, but it still comes out to the same thing. And you're right there by you stepping on the scene as the authority of that scene. As soon as you step on the scene, the atmosphere should change. Just because you're in authority doesn't mean anything. But if you look like you're in authority, in other words, you don't just come in there all slouchy and just walking in there like a deputy fife and just walking through there. But if you have your shoulders back, your head up, the gaze in your eyes and confidence in your voice, the officer's presence a lot of times will just begin to to calm the deal that's right there. Some of you right now need to walk into your mind and your heart and your thoughts and you need to start showing up and say, here I am. I'm not somewhere laying around. I'm alert. I'm alive. And I've got the authority of the power of God flowing in my spirit. Let's say that doesn't work. That's bottom level. The next level you're going to take is verbal commands. In other words, you're going to start taking authority by what you say. Uh, If just me being there is not going to help, uh, i got to start speaking to my situation. Uh, If some of you have mountains uh, that are coming in your mind, uh, you need to start speaking uh, to that mountain. Uh, The Bible says the word is nigh thee, uh, even in thy mouth. Uh, That is uh, the word of faith. Uh, You've got to start opening your mouth uh, and start talking back. Uh, It's not by might, uh, but not by power, but by God's spirit uh, that's going to fill you and cause you uh, to do whatever you need to do the word of God has to be inside of you and you may not be able to just stand there but now you're being proactive and you're speaking commanding telling I'm not asking you it's not a suggestion that you leave my mind it's not a suggestion that you go where I tell you to go it's not an option whether we're gonna go either the good way or the hard way but you're gonna get out of here devil you're getting out of my family you're getting out of my body you're getting out of my mind you're getting out of my thinking you're getting out of my passions you're getting out of my affections you're getting out of my reasoning you're getting out of here And you begin to call those things that are not as though they were. You begin to speak the word of God. When Jesus was coming there against the devil or the devil was coming against him, he said, it is written. You need to get some Bible on the inside of you and start digesting the word on the inside of you. That word will begin to give you what to say at that very hour that you need to say it. It will begin to recurgitate in your mouth. And when you come under attack and you're guarding and you're there and nothing's happening, but now you you begin to speak let's say that doesn't work let's go to the next level soft touch you're too close bro sister devil you just invaded my space soft I'm putting hands on you they shall lay hands on the sick they shall lay hands 
on the infirmed. They shall lay hands on those that are oppressed of the devil. They shall lay hands and they're going to recover. There's some situations that are trying to attack you and you need to lay hands on it. You need to go hand to hand. You start grabbing it and your whole point is you're going to get pain compliance. I'm going to exert enough pain on you that you're going to do exactly what I asked you to do. You've got to get pain compliance and you're going to keep your distance. And you tell the enemy, he's been trying, you can smell his breath. He's in your beds. He's in your passions. He's in your affections. He's in your your intellect and your reasoning power. see, See, he comes to replace. He wants to steal, but he wants to replace. And then he has another agenda for your life. He wants to replace your thought life. He wants to replace your passions. He wants to replace your intellect. He wants to replace all that. And he's so close to you. You've got to learn that you're going to keep him at bay. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Then resist the devil, and he will flee from thee. If that doesn't work, it's time to break out the baton. Regular or PR-24. I taught PR-24 for many years. PR-24. Tonfa, almost. Pain compliance. I'm getting ready to impact weapons. If you haven't noticed, devil, I'm getting ready to strike you. And it's going to hurt. See, you can, some of you are too passive. Oh, you, you're doing good in the flesh. You can come up here and try and knock the pastor out as he ducks and then. <laughs> you can get with each other and go. But God is saying, why don't you transfer all that that you know into the spirit and become violent? Bible says heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Some of you need to get radical about your walk with God. Some of you need to break out the batons, some mace, some spray, some CS gas, whatever you got. And you need to impact those weapons against the enemy and start fighting the real enemy rather than fighting each other. You've been fighting in the natural, but God has trained you in the natural. And now he wants to take you into the spiritual to where you're now fighting effectively. And if that doesn't work, you only have one other alternative, deadly force. Deadly force. Everything else has failed. Now we've got to use deadly force. It's kind of like the last option. But I have no other alternative. See, Paul was a master at using deadly force. He said, mortify the deeds of the flesh, of the mind. Kill them. Destroy them. Mortify them. He said, I die daily. I'm clearing rooms and coming in daily in my mind. I'm clearing places that no one else can see. I'm going into the recesses of of my affections and in the bowels of my understanding. I'm going into the places where no one else has. I'm coming stealth-like. I'm coming under the radar. I'm getting low so they don't hear me. I've been trained to this and I'm doing this and I have no other option. I've got to kill it. If I don't kill it, it's going to kill me. The thing that you need to understand That if you don't guard your heart, protect your heart, begin to protect your mind, your affections, and your thought life. If you don't kill it, it can kill you. This is why Paul concludes like this. Keep your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues 
of life. For out of it are the issues of life. See, the heart, it maintains our connection. It maintains our union. It maintains our life source. It connects us with God. Not this thing, but this thing. He's looking for your mind. He's looking for your affections. He's looking for your thought life, your dreams, your passions. He's looking for your imaginations. He's looking for your visions. Because the heart, it maintains this what I have, life source, my life source, your life source. The heart it also, it controls, everybody say controls. It influences, say influences. And it runs, everybody say runs, my whole life, your whole life. This thing right here, this central nervous system that I have going on up here, will set in motion my whole life. It will control me. It will influence me. Notice what it is. The heart connects us with God and it directs us in this world. So I ask you to stand today. And it doesn't matter if you're a sinner or a saint. It doesn't matter if you're saved or unsaved. It doesn't matter if you're questioning or you're sure. I'm asking you, are you willing to give God your heart? If you're willing to give Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, your heart, I want you to stand with me at this altar. The world coined the phrase, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. They didn't know how true that was. They may not understand that the mind is the heart, but they were looking at some substance that alters your thinking. But I say to us that have understanding, that have comprehension, that have wisdom, that have knowledge, that have revelation, your heart, your mind, your affections, your thinking. Some of you need to go and start setting up some alarm systems when you leave this place. Some of you need to go and put, get connected to the church and so that we can have a good surveillance of what's going on, gain access into your life. Some of you need to get a friend so they can watch your back. And some of you need some training on the escalation of force. Wherever you're at today, you might need to listen to this message again. But I want you to begin to lift up your voices unto the Lord. Submitting yourselves unto God. Submitting yourselves unto the Lord and saying, Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me right. Lord, I want to be right with you. Some of you are giving your life to the first time to Jesus Christ and you just say, Lord, come into my life. I want to serve you i'm giving up my old life and i'm i may have all kinds of stuff going on but it doesn't matter he'll take you just like you are all you've got to do is call on the name of the lord and he's going to come in and begin a relationship with you some of you are going to make your decision today that you're going to go into the waters of baptism and take on the name of jesus christ for the very first time this is for you today you need to just go ahead and do it some of you may even get filled with the baptism of the holy ghost the spirit that's going to run on the inside of you and give you power to do everything that the preacher was talking about today oh in the name of jesus if you've got the holy ghost you does not need to enter into prayer 
God is confirming the word to you with signs following. Uh, signs are on this altar. God is going to heal your body. I know the enemy wants to tell you you're never going to be healed. Uh, I know that's in your reasoning power and in your intellect. Uh, oh, but God is saying, no, 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 no. By my stripes, uh, you are healed. Uh, some of you feel like you're never going to get free. Uh, oh, I just want to take you back to the word. Uh, the Bible says whom the Lord uh, has set free is free indeed. Uh, oh, some of you feel like you're going to go back. Uh, but the Lord says, no, 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 no. All you got to keep, you do, keep doing uh, is keep your hands to the plow and don't look back. Uh, I've got your back. Uh, some of you believe you're all alone. The Lord said, no, 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 no. I'm going to be with you always, uh, even to the end of the age. Uh, I'm with you. You're not alone. That's it. Just begin to call on the name of the Lord. I want to stir your intellect. I want to stir your passions. I want to stir your affections. I want to stir your thinking again. I want to stir your ability to fight back and to do the work that God has called you to do. I want to stir it in your souls right now. Guard your hearts. Keep your hearts. Protect your hearts with all diligence, with everything in you. It's your connection, and it gives you your direction. When you're connected properly, you're directed properly. Lord Jesus, I pray for your people right now in the name of Jesus by the authority of your power and your ability to do, Lord God, I come against every word that is spoken over them that is ill and that is wrong and it's from the enemy and even from our own flesh. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now, God, that you'll give them success everywhere they go and everything they do. I pray for their families. I pray in the name of Jesus. Give them wisdom, Lord. Give them knowledge. Uh, give them understanding. Uh, give them everything they need for the journey. <laughs> Success is in your wings. Uh, oh, yeah. You are going forward and not backwards. Uh, you are progressing and not digressing. Uh, in the name of Jesus, God is with you. The Lord loves you. The Lord has called you. The Lord is invested in you. The Lord is the one that gave you dreams and visions. The Lord is the one that gave you imaginations. The Lord is the one that's going to keep you. The Lord is the one that called you because you're so passionate for him. Oh, yes, Lord. You're going to dance like David danced. You're going to pray without ceasing. You're going to call on the name of the Lord in the middle of the night, and he's going to answer you. He's going to rescue you. Jesus. That's it. Call on his name. Call on his name. Call on his name. Call on his name. Wait on the Lord. Put it all on the altar today. Anything in reserve. Anything in the cabinets. Anything you've been holding back, get connected. Start recognizing your weak spots. Yeah, the Lord is revealing that right now. He's showing you. Shore it up. Shore it up. Shore it up. Start dreaming again. Start believing again. Start seeing it again.